This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 8, The Dutch Pelagic State. Geography dealt the Netherlands a mixed hand, a land of dunes and swamps, a ribbon of sand and clay. The climate is unattractive, damp, gray, and monochromatic. Hence, perhaps, the Dutch love for brightly colored flowers. It was perceived as a land of fog and gloom, unhealthy and fever-prone, with a short spring, a hot summer, and a raw, cold winter. Harbors could freeze, which is good for skating and ice boats, but not for normal shipping. Aside from peat, the earth offered no resources, no minerals, few trees, no timber, not even stone. But being unattractive carries advantages. Long, a sparsely populated wilderness terrain, the early Dutch were born free. They escaped feudalism. Free peasants worked their own fields. Location, location, location. The real estate broker's mantra applies to this place, long untroubled by its neighbors. Being a fragmented Germany, a preoccupied France, a remote England... But ultimately, the Netherlands did become part of the Spanish Habsburg multinational dynastic state and had to fight an 80-year war for independence. We can call the Netherlands a hydraulic society because of its intense relationship to water, both fresh and salt. The country sits at the mouth of a great riverine network and what would become a canal system ideal for mobility. This is analogous to the aquatic character of South China, for so many centuries the world's most productive region. For the Dutch, major northern European rivers offer arterial connections. Barge traffic is important even today. The Netherlands is a delta for the Rhine, the Maas, and the Scheldt, the Egypt of Europe, one Englishman called it. It offered riverine passage into the rich hinterlands of Germany near the mouth of the Baltic with easy access to the Atlantic. This is a a location excellent for trade. But the Dutch have suffered a terrible vulnerability. They live at the mercy of the sea. But after each flood, they heightened the dikes, cleaned the sluices, and drained more land than ever before. The dredge, the sluice gate, the windmill become essential weapons in the never-ending warfare with the sea. The flatness of terrain encourages wind, power for windmills. Wind would be for the Dutch what coal would be for the British. Also, the Dutch would exploit peat as a useful energy source. Abundant and easy to transport, peat served to offset the lack of forest-derived energy. The Dutch used a grid pattern to create polders, land captured from the sea. Green fields segmented by blue canals resembling a Mondrian painting. The Dutch designed and built their own country. We might call it a tremendous work of architecture. Struggle with the sea is rooted in folk memory. It was said that the sea sleeps neither by day or by night but charges savagely like a lion to devour the entire land. 
The Dutch equated the tyrant sea with the tyrant Spain. With both, they waged protracted conflicts. Both were suffused with emotional fervor, perhaps even a crusading spirit encapsulated in their religious struggle against Spain of Protestants versus Roman Catholics, analogous to the Spanish crusade against the Muslims, the Moors. For the Dutch, religious freedom fused with an ardent desire for political independence. They also linked the fight against the sea to the Old Testament. The Dutch saw themselves as reincarnations of the children of Israel, survivors of the flood, with their role being separating dry land from the wet, the sweet from the salt. The legacy is that 40% of the Netherlands is now below sea level, including Schiphol Airport, where probably many of you have been. The political identity of an independent Protestant Netherlandish nation forged in a protracted conflict with the Spaniards was established from, say, 1550 to 1650 at a time of dramatic transformation of the landscape, a curbing of what was called the Volcano Ocean. The Dutch paradox is that they both fought the sea and embraced the sea. Turning back the sea perhaps gave them the confidence to master the sea. The Zuiderzee, for a long time a large and protected arm of the ocean, lying at the core of the Dutch nation, becomes the nexus for a string of seaport towns, the greatest of them being Amsterdam. Struggle with the Spaniards coincided with a burst of economic vitality and growth. This was created with a speed to be compared with the 20th century rise of Japan or South Korea. The Netherlands would be the first European state to bring a bourgeois social class to full political power. Merchants embodied the Dutch enterprise. We know their well-fed forms and smug faces from masterpieces of Dutch art. Salt water becomes a principal basis of Dutch wealth, the profits derived from extraction and carriage. The Dutch brilliantly exploited ocean as source and ocean as avenue. An ocean becomes a powerful cultural metaphor. Early on, Dutch culture was perceived as unthinkable without the ocean. In 1596, the governing body, the States General, declared, the general welfare of the country depends upon the dominion of the sea. The Protestant Reformation attracted many Dutch to Calvinism, defining them as a chosen people. This gave them self-confidence to begin and continue their struggle for independence from the Habsburgs. In 1568, Philip II determined to crush the heresy. A decade later, seven northern provinces responded by tenuously joining in the Union of Utrecht as the United Provinces, the United Netherlands, or the Dutch Republic. These provinces were roughly the same area as the Netherlands today. The other provinces, today's Belgium, would remain predominantly Roman Catholic. They were more exposed to the power of Spanish steel and the prowess of Spanish infantry than Europe's finest. And Belgium, known as the Spanish Netherlands, would stay part of the Habsburg Empire until the 19th century. Antwerp was a potential rival to Amsterdam as a port, but its Skelt River could be cut off from the sea, unlike Venice or Amsterdam. 
That city experiences a series of ups and downs and never really found its cruising rhythm or long-term equilibrium. Margaret of Parma, regent of the Spanish Netherlands, the Habsburg sister of Spanish Philip II, noted of Antwerp, there is always a feeling of failure in the air. Belgium today suffers from malaise. With independence, the United Provinces become a major world power rapidly. The world's first modern economy, it's been called. A high-voltage enterprise, physically compressed into a cramped but tidy space. The UP had the highest per-density population in Europe, being predominantly urban when the rest of Europe was not. Density of population was both challenge and opportunity. It demands a high level of social organizational skills relating to food supply and transport, sanitation, welfare, and so forth. But it provides a buoyant market, and the proximity of urban life nourishes opportunity by encouraging the exchange of ideas. Because farmland was created and scarce, it was treasured, manicured, and worked intensely. Farmers were rotating grain crops with clover, legumes, and fodder crops, using ample dressings of manure for greater soil fertility. The Dutch farmer got more meat from his pigs, bred larger cattle, and got more milk and butter from his cows. The efficiency of Dutch agriculture freed others for different wealth-generating activities in industry, commerce, and shipping. But agriculture formed the base of the most extensive and exclusively maritime polity yet seen. Located at a crossroads of the seas, the Baltic, the Channel, the Atlantic, midway between the Baltic and the Atlantic Mediterranean routes, Everything passed by, English tin, Spanish wool, French wines, as well as Russian furs, Swedish iron, Polish grain and timber from the Baltic fringes. All were carried on an easy pathway along the North Sea coast. The Dutch created the first great global trading state, their presence had geographical spread, extending to America, Africa, and Asia. It also had functional spread. Like Iberia, a political and naval power, but unlike Iberia, the Dutch added commercial to strategic and economic power. What is the Dutch secret? They grasped the essential conditions of political and economic strength, the control of vital transport routes, the amassing of capital, and the accumulation of information. These are part of what economist Charles Kindleberger termed social capability, the human vitality of a society manifested in organizational skills. This, this is like so much else of importance, not subject to quantification. But as Einstein remarked, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. The quantitative must often yield to the qualitative. Literacy and Education may be a partial measure of vitality, but it, it must be factored with the less specific, the emotional, political, and intellectual questions must be judged. Dutch expansion was based upon exploitation of existing maritime networks, European and other. 
beginning in the Baltic with those of the Hanseatic League and culminating in those of Indonesia abutting the South China Sea. The Dutch were not explorers or discoverers, except incidentally. Only rarely were they missionaries. One scornful Englishman summed up the Dutch attitude as, Jesus Christ may be good, but business is better. The Dutch were not proselytizers of religion or culture, but merchants, complete pragmatists. A Dutch captain, it was said, would take his ship into hell to trade with the devil if he did not fear that in the process his sails would catch on fire. The great Dutch poet Vondel sums it up. Wherever profit leads us to every sea and shore, for love of gain, the wide world's harbors we explore. Ships' names tell us something. The Spaniards and the Portuguese chose names like Mother of God, Most Holy Trinity, connoting godliness. British ships might be indomitable, resolution, revenge, conveying heroism. The Dutch in their ship names, herring, spotted cow, good beer, exhibit a splendid, stubborn single-mindedness. The French historian Fernand Bordel notes that the Dutch were able to maintain an economic tie with Spain despite political conflict. It was profit above politics. They would sell munitions even to foes who would shoot them back at them. Most notoriously, the Muslim Barbary states of North Africa. Whoever won or lost the battle, the Dutch would always gain on the commercial exchange. The Dutch had their principles, it was said. The first was flexibility. Hardworking Calvinists set the prevailing tone. Idleness is the devil's own pillow, they said. These people were frugal, systematic, ruthless, unscrupulous, and successful in achieving their goals. But there's much more to say about the characteristics of the Dutch experience. So stay tuned for Episode 9. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry. With additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Production by 1623 Studios, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Post-production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Foray. Goodbye until next time. <laughs>